Hello, everybody. Uh, I see a lot of new faces in the crowd tonight. Very excited. Uh, so this, welcome to SVIXD. This is a monthly guest lecture that we do kind of, you know, on different topics around interaction design. And the goal is to kind of like expand the definition of interact interaction design and what it, and what it could be. Uh, so I'm beyond excited to uh, have uh, Daniel Burka join us this, uh, this evening. Um, just to set the scene, um, we wanted to have a talk that's like kind of around the intersection of design and uh, VC, uh, VCs, venture capital uh, firms. VCs in recent times have been kind of like building up their design presence. Uh, some of you might have met Albert Lee at uh, NEA and uh, Kinda Perkins has been having a design fellowship for a few years now. Um, but GV was, Google Ventures was the first to do so with uh, Braden Coitz joining as a design partner in 2010 and it is one of the most prominent design uh, partner teams uh, today. Um, and we have, uh, Daniel Burka is one of five partners at GV with a design background and GV has been in the news a lot recently because of their launch of the Sprint, uh, Sprint book which uh, details their design sprint methodology. Um, and anyone who's seen the uh, Envision movie will be pretty familiar with Daniel's face <laughs> by now. Um, just a little bit of introduction, although Daniel's going to go further into it. Uh, Daniel spent more than a decade helping startups with product design. Highlights include his work with Mozilla, where he helped design the F Firefox brand, five, five years with the social network Dig, and early involvement with uh, gaming startup that morphed into Slack. And he also co-founded a startup that was acquired by Google. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's welcome Daniel uh, to IXE. <laughs> So the way we're going to do it tonight is it's more like a free forum Q&A. Um, I've submitted some questions to Daniel, but uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, definitely start thinking and um, pose it to Daniel anytime soon. All right. Thanks. All right. So I'm, I'm going to try to talk without a mic. I think I talk fairly loudly. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Back corner can hear. Um, so just tell me if I'm not talking loudly enough. Um, ideally, I think it would be more fun for me and probably for you guys if we do this more like seminar style. So if you have questions in the middle of while I'm talking or want me to clarify about something, um, I'm not too worried if we don't get through all the questions. Um, so I'd be happy to go down tangents or, or kind of get into details on some shit. Um, so just feel free to put up your hand or yell out at me if I'm not looking at you. Um, so Cozy sent me some questions and I thought the most interesting way to, to go about this would just be go through them in the order he sent them to me. Um, so um, I'm Daniel Burka. Um, the first question he had was, what, what was your path to here? So I've been designing probably longer than any of you. Um, I started a design agency when I was about uh, 16 with my twin brother and uh, some friends in eastern Canada. So I grew up in like pretty rural Canada in a place called Prince Edward Island. Wow. If you ever have blue mussels, might be from where I'm from. Um, but it's like not like a tech center, right? So like there were a bunch of us in high school and we were interested in nerd shit and we you know, kind of glommed together and decided to form, you know, we were young enough, stupid enough or arrogant enough, depending on which way you look at it, that we thought we could start a company together. Um, and we just started hacking on design. And at the, the time, um, I was like a, actually a copywriter for the company. Uh, so I was mostly doing writing. And uh, I was also going to school full time. So a few of us were, were going to university while we started the company. Um, so I did an eight year undergrad in history. Uh, <laughs> so eventually, you know, when I was in like third, you know, second and third year, we started getting like bigger contracts with companies. And I'd have to go to tell my professors, they'd be like, yeah, so it was really fun starting that class. I know we're a month in, but I'm gonna drop out of all my classes and I'm gonna go do like a two month contract in Maryland. And I'd fly down to the US and go work on a pro project. Um, and so I started as a, as a writer and then one day we were working on a project and, and my brother was designing it and I was like, you know, we didn't have enough resources and I was like, oh, you know, I'll take a stab at that and I was interested in graphic design and, you know, getting critique from my friends, I was really lucky to, to kind of learn a lot of design. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I'm partly saying this because I think it's really, it was really uh, beneficial for me. I think most younger designers benefit from having um, some people around them who are both passionate about the things that they're doing, you know, kind of that's one of the benefits of coming to a program like you guys are in is finding some like-minded people. Um, but the other thing is that the, my friends were the kind of people who would call me on my shit, you know, if things weren't aligned, if things weren't done right, if I wasn't taking the right strategy at something, they weren't too nice to me. They'd tell me what was wrong and how I could be doing better. And 
you know, we really, you know, being that far out and that early on the, the internet, you know, this is the, the uh, early 2000s, you know, formed the company in 99. It might be the oldest web design company in ca Canada. It's still in business. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way we really learned was both about reading stuff online, looking at people's source code, you know, being able to look at that, you know, how people like Jeffrey Zeldman and these people who are you know, in New York and now I get to hang out with, which is still crazy to me, um, you kind of how they were all doing things. And we just learned by hacking and trying and looking at what other people were doing and uh, critiquing each other a lot. And that, that was really uh, beneficial to my career. Um, and then we ended up kind of building up, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem when you're, you're starting off as a, uh, doing a design agency, is that you know, nobody will hire you until you do you know, bigger projects. And we figured out um, some hacks of how to get kind of big, big projects. And the first one was that we really wanted to do e-commerce work. And this is like early in the days when people were still afraid to put their credit cards online. Um, uh, sorry, I was about to ask how old everybody is, but maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, does anybody even know what a block.gif is? No. All right, so none of you have been designing nearly as long as me. Um, so we wanted to work on uh, big e-commerce projects, but nobody would hire us to, to do it, right? And so we actually, and this was my mom's idea, we worked out of my mom's attic for a while. Um, my mom suggested that we go and talk to a local e-commerce company that was doing like a big catalog company that marketed all over Canada, a big gardening company, um, and go and offer to do a free website for them based on commission. And so no money up front, but we you know, make like a 6% commission on online sales. And their, their site at the time totally sucked. And so when they ran the numbers, they were like, oh, great. You know, we're going to get a new website for you know, X thousand dollars. Like, that doesn't seem like much money. And we, you know, something like 6X or 8X their sales in the first year, it worked out to be a, a really good business for us. And also let us kind of gave us the, the inroads to get to work on, on more projects like that. And then the second inflection point for the business was a similar thing, but very different, is uh, back when Firefox was uh, you know, the very nascent, so it just rolled out of, so I don't know if any of you guys remember the history of Firefox, but basically there was Netscape. Netscape got acquired by AOL. Some engineers inside of AOL were like, this is fucking dumb. This is like a big, heavy piece of software. And they decided to make this, you know, roll it out as Mozilla on its own and make a light piece of just, just browser software, which was revolutionary at the time. So it's Ben Goodger and the other guy. Um, and uh, they launched it, and one of our, our uh, designers uh, was using it, and he thought it was great. But the interface looked terrible. You know, it looked like a amateur hour. And he wrote an open letter on his blog, which people blogged back then, and, uh, and said, like, hey, guys, like, this is great software, but I think the visuals and the overall fit and finish are really letting the product down, and you won't succeed. And this guy from Mozilla wrote back, and this is like, to us at the time, like this is some guy from California wrote us back. Like it was crazy. I mean, we're you know kind of this small town mentality a little bit. It was still wild to hear from somebody in California. He goes, "I read your letter. We passed around the office. We all like agree with you. You guys should fix it." And we're like, "Fuck! It's an open source project. Like we could fix it." <laughs> And so we got permission to get put together this group called the Mozilla Visual Identity Team. It was um, me and Steven and um, John Hicks, who's an illustrator in the UK, really, really talented guy, and a few other people. And uh, we ended up developing the Firefox brand at the time, which was fucking fun. You know, we did this thing. It was like the first like, large-scale community project I'd ever worked on. Um, you know, the, the brand went out, and then we, we had, uh, I was in charge of redesigning the website as well. And uh, it was kind of my first lesson in in uh, people coming out with pitchforks in, in the community because we changed it a lot. It went from being like a really uh, kind of um, Russian constructivist kind of look to more friendly and consumery, and developers are very upset about this. Um, anyway, that's a whole other tangent. <laughs> but we found these kind of two hooks. There are two of these major hooks in our business to be able to work on bigger things. And doing the Mozilla work led to um, this guy named Kevin Rose contacted us, uh, and he had made a website called dig.com. And uh, it was about two months into after he launched the site, he uh, contacted us and asked uh, if we'd help him redesign it. He'd seen the Mozilla work. And that was the first like big Bay Area startup that we had ever worked for. And a few months later, I decided to move down to California and be the, the head of design there. Um, so 
yeah, that's the next chapter. Is I, I'm about 12, uh, 11 years ago, I moved to the United States. I moved to San Francisco and um, was the lead designer and then creative director at this fairly big at the time startup. Um, and from there, you know, Kevin and I uh, started another company called Pounce that we sold to, to Six Apart. It was like a social network back in 2008. Um, and then I left Dig around the, the zenith of, of the site um, just before the dive. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember that. And, um, and something I've always wanted to do in my career is, is keep pushing myself to learn new, new stuff. And I jumped into a gaming startup coming out of, of Dig and joined Stuart Butterfield and Cal Henderson, so the, the team from Flickr. So I don't know if you guys remember, Flickr was originally a game, and a failed game, and then it had a photos component. They made that into Flickr, and they decided to go make another game, and I thought that seemed interesting. I'm like, that was a failed game, and they turned into Slack, so Stuart's pretty good at this, uh, this pattern. I think everybody will invest in his next game not expecting it to be a game. <laughs> um, but I worked there for, for a while, and that was really interesting, because game design is, is much, much different than web application design. You're dealing with motion, you're dealing with um, delight, in a way that you really, you know, we're just getting to now in, in application design. And, uh, and it was a really nice segue that the next thing I did is uh, Kevin, the guy from Dig, he and I started uh, a company called Milk that was a mobile app incubator company, kind of spinning up, the plan was to spin up a bunch of startups doing mobile work. But the gaming world and the mobile world are actually more similar. There's, there's a lot more you can do in terms of interaction design uh, in that paradigm. Um, and that company was bought by Google and um, Shortly thereafter, I, I came over to GV. Um, so, what is what does a design partner in venture capital do? Um, what is GV? So, I, in a lot of ways, in most ways, in fact, don't work at Google. Uh, Google is uh, our LP. So, in, in investing, you have uh, usually have limited partners, and so these are the people who put the cash into your fund. Um, Google is our only LP, um, and so they give us about $450 million a year. So every year we get $450 million, and we take that money and we invest it in startups. Um, so a lot of things you'd expect, you know, a lot of tech companies, uh, you know, a lot of big data kind of stuff, but we do about 40% of our investing right now in the life sciences area. Um, so we invest in Flatiron Health here in the city, we invest in Quartet, which is a, so Flatiron's a big data oncology company, uh, Quartet's a company around in the mental health care space. Um, we invest in uh, Grail, which is, uh, they're making a blood diagnostic for cancer. It's a company in California. Um, so we invest in, in quite a few life sciences companies. Um, and we've built up a design practice within the venture firm. So this is still a really, really rare thing. So there are individual designers in venture. Um, there, there's a bunch of them now. Uh, but we're the only design team in, in venture capital. There are, there are five of us. And we spend most of our time working with portfolio companies. So I actually, if you ask me about things at Google, I have very little knowledge of what happens inside Google. I almost never go to the office here, and uh, they don't really tell me what they're working on. Um, I spend most of my time working with the companies that we've invested in. And the basic thesis is that um, the normal currency in venture capital, so if you think about, you know, in California, there's a, a road called Sand Hill Road that all the big fancy venture capital firms are on, you know, Sequoia, Greylock, like, you know, Kleiner Perkins, all the, I don't know if you've heard of any venture funds, but if you've heard of any, they're, they're on that road. Um, and typically, if you go in, and shop your company around on Sand Hill Road and try to raise investment, there are some common things you get. You get cash. You get lots of money injecting your company in exchange for equity. You choose a partner to work with or a firm to work with that has good connections. So connections are this other thing, because when you're trying to create partnerships or um, looking for an acquisition or you know, all kinds of, you know, kind of benefits of having uh, connections, your VC is often a good way to, to get introductions. And then the other one's advice. right? So generally, a lot of the, the venture partners in uh, the Bay Area used to, are operators, right? So they used to run big companies. You know, we have the co one of the founders of Excite.com. We have a bunch of people who've spent time at Google you know, on operational teams. Um, and this is common across venture. A lot, of, a lot of people can give you advice. Um, but you've seen a trend in the last five or six years where venture firms have started uh, also offering services. So there's recruiting services, marketing, PR, those kinds of things. And teams have started investing in designers. 
Um, so adding that to the mix is a, another thing you can offer. And the, one of the interesting things to me about venture is it's very close to the gears of capitalism. So you know, when we invest in, in companies, the, the intention is to invest in them for profit. Right? And so if we're designers and we're working with portfolio companies, the very explicit intent is that we are making those companies more valuable. Um, we will be judged in the end on whether or not we generated increased returns for the fund. Um, I think there are other reasons that you know, you know, we invest in. We don't just invest for profit. We also invest because we want certain things to exist in the world. And you know, we're not just investing, you know, finding arbitrage opportunities. We're not a hedge fund. Um, so I shouldn't talk so, so down about hedge funds in New York. My, my older brother works at, at Two Sigma, which is a big algorithmically traded hedge fund. And if he was here, I'd still say the same thing. Um, <laughs> but so the, the way we think about design often is as, as an added investment. So we've invested, say, $10 million into a company. But if we go and spend a week or two weeks doing design work with them with the whole team, you know, five senior designers for two weeks. Like, this is a significant investment. You know, this is probably, you know, I don't know if you can extrapolate, but like a $60,000 investment from our team. Um, that's real money. And we do this because we think we can create significantly more value in, in the companies that we invest in. Um, and the ways we do that are, there are kind of high leverage things we can do with the companies. A lot of it's around product work. So at, a fund fundamental level, and I'll get into this in a bit, um, design and product management come very, very close to each other. So product management is generally the people in your business who are choosing kind of what, what to build and why to build it um, and how to measure whether or not you're building the right thing. Um, I think as many designers become more senior and more deeply embedded in business, um, you become closer and closer to that level of things. And when I think of product design as a term, that's, that's what I think of. Um, so we do a lot of product strategy, working with product leaders on, on helping them uh, kind of uh, reduce risk and find bigger opportunities. Uh, that's the, the simplest way to talk about it. Um, and uh, we also do things like, you know, the nice thing is, is you know, because we're uh, working with them in, in the intent of creating value, we can find kind of all kinds of leverage points. I help teams hire talent. That's another big thing we can do. So meet with them, talk about kind of where they're, where the gaps are in their, their current talent, where their team currently, you know, how their team's currently structured, and work with them on kind of building a healthier, better design environment within their companies, and making sure the design team's working on the right types of things. I work with teams on branding stuff, so I'm helping uh, two of our big life sciences companies right now do go through uh, significant branding projects. Um, and usually, you know, when, when you think of branding projects, it's not just like designing a logo for them. It's like we're thinking about this as like a significant brand system, so we make sure we talk to our customers right. Sorry. Do you guys work on brand stuff? Right yeah. Do people think brands just logos? Yeah, yeah it sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So we do, we're really flexible, and we all, you know, uh, everybody on our team's fairly senior. We run as kind of independently, like there's nobody in charge of our team. We're five old people. <laughs> Basically, we've all been designing stuff for a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we do in venture. Did anybody who asked this question have more questions about kind of what, what a design partner is in VC? Yeah, what's up? So what often happens, and you know, this literally happened to me today, right? So I was doing office hours with a company today where I spend about literally an hour with them. And they're like, yeah, hey, we designed this new marketing page. What do you think? And I'm like, OK, like, kind of who's coming to this page? And they're like, well, we think it's you know, this type of customer. And then we're like, OK, like, how does that person shop for your product? Like, this is a complex product. It's something around, um, uh, it's building basically a freelance network of engineers. right? And the way that people who need freelance engineering talent shop is like non-trivial. It's really hard. right? You know, they're almost certainly not coming directly to you. They're almost certainly coming with some baggage. And they've got a certain set of needs that they need to make sure you've filled, right? And so when I talk to companies like this, I'm helping them think strategically through kind of how do you consider the, I would call it a shopping funnel, 
right? How do you consider the shopping funnel? Like this person has probably looked at five other things. Well, let's look at what the five other most popular competitors to you are so we know kind of what we're up against. Kind of how to, to both play on the things they're familiar with, but also set you apart and find what, what your big differentiator is for making that decision. And then think through kind of how the user is making a decision. So usually I'm backing people up because they, they come to me and want to talk about design. You know, like, how do you feel about our colors? And I'm like, I don't really, like, whatever. Um, let's talk about the language you're using. Let's talk about the process that you've got. Um, you know, I, I can critique colors too. I'm a pretty good visual designer. But, um, but I want to make sure they're actually doing the right thing before I make sure that, um, you know, and maybe redesign their marketing sites actually shouldn't be their top priority right now. That was the first thing we talked about. Um, I was like, where does this need come from? Um, so a lot of this is like uh, steering them in the right direction in terms of priorities and in terms of uh, overall execution. Um, but one of the interesting things, if I can kind of rant on this a little bit, is you have to be really careful when you work in venture of not immediately telling, not defaulting to the mode of like, well, you might be doing the wrong thing. Because entrepreneurs, if you ever work at a startup, this is really important to think about, is nobody got into business by thinking they might be wrong. Like you have to have a certain amount of hubris to start a company, right? Because like if it was just so easy to obviously start a company and make something that everybody's going to want and you're going to make millions of dollars, like, Yes, we would all be entrepreneurs, and the world would be wonderful. And, um, but it's not. You're taking massive guesses, and you're trying to guess you know, what's going to happen and how to be, you know, whether or not you're right. And you've got all these people telling you you're wrong. And, but these people who've gotten to the stage we're at with them have basically ignored all those people. And they'd be like, no, 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 I know, I know you think this is stupid. I know you think I'm going to lose all my money, and like, I'm going to waste two years of my life. But like, fuck you. I'm starting a company, and this is going to be awesome. <laughs> Um, and so a lot of the times what I'm doing is, is working with that energy, right? And the, I'm assuming they're right as well. You know, we shouldn't have invested in them if we thought it was a bad idea. And so I'm assuming they're right, but helping them test their assumptions much more quickly, right? Because what happens is most companies kind of build, you know, take the ship early, ship often method of making products, which is uh, fairly risky if you stop and think about it. You know, you spend, uh, you know, few months working on a product, you put it out in the market, you burn all your customers because like it turns out you weren't building the right thing. Well shit, you know, it's really hard to back up. Now you've got code debt, now your customers are expecting something else. Um, so as a design team, what I'm helping them do is kind of make sure they quick, quickly make better decisions, but at the same time find ways to test their assumptions and do quick research to find um, kind of where those risks and opportunities are within their ideas. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, most companies do want us to come work with them because we're free. Um, and we're not bad at what we do, I think. Um, so again, I work fairly close to the gears of capitalism. Uh, there's uh, a set of factors we use, criteria we use for choosing which companies to invest more time in. You know, and you again, you know, like I was saying, we think of this as an inv extra investment into the company. So we clearly spend more time with companies that we've invested more dollars into and that we own more equity in. So it's, it's this combination of factors. We might have invested $10 million but only own 1% of the company. We might have invested $2 million but we own 40% of the company, right? And so these are the, the things that uh, affect our returns. So that's a major factor in it. The, we got really realistic about this as a design team a couple of years ago. We sat down and and really kind of went through all the projects we had worked on in the last six months and we're like, kind of why did we work on them? And part of it, a big part of it's that investment decision. And then some of it is also um, uh, our own personal passions about it. You know, like I am luckily in this job where I can somewhat optimize my job for what I want to be doing. And for me personally and, and most other guys on the design team are, we're much more interested in working on things that are really mission driven. So if you, you know, I really like working on the life sciences projects. So you know, here in New York, I spent a lot of time with Quartet and uh, uh, the mental health company and Flatiron Health. I mean, my mom died of cancer. Flatiron's trying to cure cancer. Like, fuck cancer. I'll go work on that. Um, it's also a huge investment for us. So there's a bunch of these companies that are in the sweet spot. So we work with the entire portfolio in in a light way. You know, we'll do office hours with everybody. But the, in terms of the larger investments of our time, we. Uh, it's, it's 
leverage. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Yeah, we do a bit of everything. Um, so it's really, again, on a per company basis. Some companies, the, uh, the marketing stuff is really important. Uh, most of the time we're working on product stuff. I mean, fundament I, I, I'm most of us are more interested and the uh, benefit of working on product stuff is a lot more uh, significant. So I would say, realistically, we've probably spent 90% of our time working on product stuff. Um, but marketing stuff can be very high impact. Right, like we worked on with Slack, for instance. We also invested in Slack later, so um, uh, we worked with Slack on the out of box flow for Slack, mm -hmm. and th that's you know the first thing you see is the marketing site, and we did a significant amount of testing with them on kind of uh, what they were doing, and they were about to run these all these TV ads that they've created, and so for us we were like, oh, you're about to spend X millions of dollars on TV ads. Well, if the front door to your website like is in a disconnect from the message people got from the television ads, you know, because you might be tempted to go type in this URL, but if you don't kind of have this continuum of the user experience and then this easy flow into a fairly complex product, um, that's, a, that's wasted money. You know, it's my money that's being wasted, right? <laughs> we, this is actually how we think of it. I think that's not insignificant. So, you know, a design agency, they work for hours, right? I walk into companies acting like I own the place because I partly own the place. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I'm not going in there and lecturing them what to do, but I feel ownership over the, the product. I want to work on the things that seem most important because I also want their product to be successful. So the entrepreneurs and I are very closely aligned. They want to be successful as a business. I want them to be successful as a business. And sometimes that's marketing stuff. Usually it's product stuff. We invest in a, a huge range of companies. So we invested in Uber at a fairly late stage. So we invested over $200 million into Uber fairly late. Um, we have had entrepreneurs and residents at the fund who don't even really have their idea yet. They're experimenting. I've spent a bunch of time working with our EIRs on um, kind of figuring out, are they even fundamentally working on the right thing? And that's, that's us really fun, because we can help them circumvent major mistakes really quickly. So I've worked across the entire gamut. Yeah. What's up? So Google, we are not, we do not report anything to Google other than our basic financial, you know, uh, uh, things you would tell your LP. Um, so we are an independent venture capital fund. So sorry if I'm being pedantic, but this is important, is that we, um, we're not a strategic fund for Google. We're not investing in things that Google's interested in. We're investing in things that we think are good investments. So we're much more similar to like Greylock or Kleiner Perkins than we are to like Intel Ventures or Steamboat Ventures, which is Disney's venture arm. Those are strategic funds. Um, we will invest in things that are competitive to Google. We'll invest in things that are totally unrelated to Google. Um, and we're definitely not reporting back to Sergey and Larry like, oh, this company's going sideways. Um, that would be a conflict of interest for us. Um, so, but I will, you know, within our fund, you know, there's 80 of us at the fund. Um, if a company I think is, and this doesn't happen often, you know, I'm not like a tattletale back to, back to our fund. But if I think a company is like just fundamentally making bad decisions, or they're structured, you know, in a, in a bad way, or you know, somebody, you know, uh, you know. Uh, Basically, if, I th if we're on their board and there's something the board, you know, our member of the board should know about, sure. Like, I will occasionally go and talk to our general partner and say, hey, I've been inside this company. I think there's this piece that's dysfunctional, and uh, I think you guys should go work on it. Um, and that's, that's a board's job is to improve the function of a company. I'm not tattletailing on them. They're just like, he's in a, you know, our, board, our GP is often in a position to help make that change uh, happen. Yeah. yeah, what's up? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so general partners are the, the partners in a fund who generally write the checks, right, and make the, the fundamental investment decisions. So as design partners at GV, we have um, not that strong a role on the investing side. So sometimes I'm involved in investing decisions, um, you know, particularly if a company has uh, design as a differentiator. 
Um, and I, I'm in a bunch of the pitches and stuff. Uh, but my and design partner this is actually I didn't really answer the question. Design partner is is a amorphous name. There are some design partners at other funds who primarily invest in design companies, like Jeff Fein, for instance. Over he's in London, has been investing in, in a bunch of design companies uh, at True Ventures. Um, so sometimes design partners are more involved in the investing decisions. We're somewhat involved, but not, not deeply involved in the investing side of the house. We're mostly working outwards with the portfolio that we've already invested in. So one of the big things we do is, is design sprints with them, uh, with portfolio companies. And this is how we, um, this is something we do over and over again, but this is an evolving process that we've kind of come to over a few years of work with the portfolio. Um, so no, it's not, it's not that repetitive. Um, there, there are some things that we kind of learned by rote, and if you go to the gv.com library, we have a bunch of articles on Medium, basically. Um, anything that we heard like 20 times, the same question, like you know, what kind of designer should I hire? How much should I pay designers? Um, all these kinds of things we wrote articles about because it's kind of like our library is almost like an FAQ uh, with the portfolio. Um, so there's a lot of novelty in what I do. Like every day I'm meeting with very strange companies doing very new things. Um, so like today I was working with two life sciences companies, a company that's doing like hardcore security analytics and a company that's building a entrepreneur, uh, an engineering network with uh, uh, engineers in Africa, which is super interesting. Um, but we, we built this process called a design sprint uh, Jake Knapp initiated this at, at Google, he's one of my colleagues, um, and then brought it over to GV. Uh, and we've been kind of honing this with startups. We've done something like 130 of these to date. Um, and uh, this is, a lot, all the time when we're working with portfolio companies, we're not so much doing their design work for them. You know, there's only five of us in 320 companies, I think. Um, there's no way we can just be their design muscle. You know. Uh, warm bodies of designers in their offices. Um, but what we will do is come in and teach them a process. And the way we teach it is not in the abstract. It's not like, hey, I'm going to come in and run a workshop with you guys for a week. Because um, no startup would ever do that. Like, they just wouldn't stop for a week and do a workshop. And two, like, learning something in the abstract is like sort of fucking useless. I mean, I'm sure you guys run into this in, in your lectures a lot. Like it's. Seems interesting, but like you really learn how to do things by getting your, your hands dirty. Um, and so we found this way that we can go into companies and actually solve real problems with them in, in the company, and at the same time teach them how to kind of repeat this process after we leave. And so a design sprint is basically um, we'll talk to a company, and we'll, the first question we'll ask is so, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? Right? So basically, what are your OKRs, your what is it, objective key results um, for the next quarter, right? Uh, and it's usually these big objectives, right? It's like, hey, you know, we're trying to enter a new market and do this thing. We're trying to, you know, significantly increase the inbound from our marketing page, or we're the funnel in our sign up is is broken and we need to significantly increase uh, sign ups. You know, there's a bazillion things it could be, right? And so we talk to them about these kind of high critical things that they're trying to, trying to solve. And what you find in, in companies around these things is there's often a ton of disagreement in the company. So people are sitting in meeting rooms. I don't know if a bunch of you guys have worked at companies before, right? Before coming here? Yeah. So you've all been in meeting rooms where everyone is talking really quickly and really loudly and passionately about what users are going to do. And if you really back it up and look at it, none of them fucking know. Right? And that's where a lot of the heat comes from and a lot of the tension comes from. Is because like, no, our users are going to do X. And someone else says, no, users are going to do Y. And you're like, OK, like, everybody just calm down for a second and just write that down as a question. We just don't know this. It's fine. Like, you don't have to be right. You just kind of come back to the entrepreneurs thing where like, entrepreneurs are expected to be right all the time. If you ever worked at a company, you look at the CEO and you're like, what should we do next? And they're like, I think we should do that. And they're like, they're not sure that's the right thing to do, right? But they're, everyone's looking at them. And so what we're trying to do with the design sprint is take it from that, that mode of like, here's the thing we think we should do, but go and test it in just a week. Because a normal mode of operation in, in a startup 
sorry if this is a little like rambling. But the normal ship early, ship off mode of making products that almost every startup we invest in is, is in the process of doing is you come up with uh, an idea. It's usually the problem is here is that you've got six ideas and you argue about them verbally. You choose one of them. You take that idea, you engineer as quickly as you can. And quickly as you can is usually three or four weeks at the minimum, right? Which is a lot of time in a startup, right? You're burning your own way and you're burning your cash. And then by the time you've made it, now you've kind of fallen in love with it. And even if you're having second guesses, you know, so you're having doubts, you decide to launch it anyway. Launching things has a lot of risk in it because you can piss off your customers, you can um, you know, have a bad press cycle, there's all kinds of bad things that can happen. And then you try to measure the results. And you know, do you guys remember the, the, the quote, I think it was Einstein said there are um, lies, damn lies, and statistics? Um, so if you've ever tried to look at analytics, even with a really good researcher, there's a lot of ambiguity in the results. And sometimes you'll know something's working or you know it's not working, but it's very hard to know why it's working or it's not working, right? And then the problem is, is normally, everybody talks about this as the iterative you know, cycle, but teams almost never actually go back around the loop and iterate and improve on the thing because they've already built out a roadmap and now they're working on other stuff, right? Um, so that's another really common problem. And now you end up, you know, even if the idea sucks and everyone agrees it sucks, it's really hard to pull features out of products. You know, because you'll piss off your customers, you'll create code debt, you know, leave tendrils of code uh, in your site, and then you're building up a, a rat's nest of code. So we looked at that problem and we're like, well, hang on a second, like, why are we launching things this way anyway? And the biggest reason people do this is because they want to create some certainty around the guesses they're making. So everyone was sitting in that conference room arguing vociferously and they're like, crap, like, how, the only way we'll know this is to launch it, right? Well, it turns out that's not, obviously not the only way to, to know something. And so we've created this design sprint where you're basically creating a prototype in four days. And on the fifth day, you bring in five customers who are very typical customers of your product um, and testing the prototype against them. So there's an extremely lightweight way to kind of fake this ship early, ship often method. But you didn't waste any time engineering. You only pissed off five customers if it went wrong. And you didn't create any code debt. And the, the other way I think about it is you're kind of measuring your trajectory. And you, know, you, you talk to tons of startups, and they think they're going really, really fast, but they really have their foot on the gas, and they're driving from one ditch into the other ditch. And the car's making lots of noise, and there's smoke going everywhere, and like you're going through gas. like It seems really quick. And if you step back a little bit and you look at them, you're like, oh my god, like woo, woo, woo. it's crazy town. And so if you measure a little bit, you know, it doesn't create perfect certainty talking to five customers, or you know, if you do two sprints in a row, even talking to ten customers doesn't give you perfect certainty, you know, no doubt. But it gives you a considerable amount of directional feedback, and you make sure you're at least generally facing the road when you put your foot on the gas. And you can build a lot more confidently and actually get where you're going a lot more quickly. Um, so the design sprint is five days. On the first day, we get everybody in, we get a group together, a design sprint group. Really importantly, it's not just designers. It's usually two or three designers, an engineer, a product manager, and other people in the company who've got unique insights. Sometimes that's salespeople, sometimes it's customer service people, sometimes it's robotics, roboticists, depending on who you're working with, or oncologists, if you're working with an oncology company. Um, so these kind of other experts. So we get a team about seven or eight people together in a room for an entire week, you know, kind of stepping back and trying to take that, that trajectory view. Um, the first day, kind of, we get all the, the information on the table. The second day, we create a bunch of sketches of possible concepts that might work. We vote on those concepts to kind of figure out kind of which ones have the most potential. And then on the, the next day, we, the Wednesday and Thursday, we kind of build a prototype. And on Friday, we test it with customers. Um, I won't go into the, the whole details of it. You can go to gv.com slash sprint if you want to. There's a bunch of free articles about it. And if you want to buy a book, there's a book on Amazon. Um, I'm not here to sell books. It's not a big deal. Um, but, uh, but that's the, the general thesis of why we, we do sprints. And the, the overall goal is, hey, now we've given the company great, you know, be better directional feedback on major product decisions. And ideally, you know, if I ran a startup again, and this is why I encourage our, you know, the CEOs and, and product people in our companies to do, is to stop, you know, every quarter or every four months 
and do something like this, a directional exercise, to make sure that where you're really throwing all your resources is the right way to go. Um, it's not like the constant way of working, but it's a good way, you know, a few times a year to set strong directional. Uh, uh, yeah, what's up? So we've got a few little exercises we do. Some of this feels like a little. I mean, when I first joined the team, I was like, "Oh, this is some consultancy bullshit." Um, but it turns out that a few of the exercises are really effective. Um, what we're, we're doing when we're voting, so we put all these sketches up on the walls, and, uh, and we vote on them silently. We do almost nothing in big groups of people talking. You know, brainstorming is, is not nearly as valuable as people think it is, and um, a bunch of people sitting around a conference table debating stuff is almost entirely useless. Um, the room that we're in, you know, there's eight of us in the room usually, you know, eight to ten people, and it's almost always kind of a library atmosphere. It's everyone working on their own. So on the sketches, for instance, it's not collaborative. You're sitting on your own, developing your own sketches in quite high detail. Um, you know, they're not pretty, but there are you know lots of real text and, and real detail. And then when we vote on them, everyone's going around silently evaluating each one on its own merits. You, the person who made it does not defend it. It has to stand on its own. Um, and they're voting with these little stickers on it. And so we kind of look at you know, then we'll go around the room and say, oh, okay, where are the most stickers? Let's talk about why people gravitated towards that idea. Um, and that's a very, very effective way to make smart group decisions. Um, but it's also not a democracy. In the end, usually the product manager or the CEO um, will put a star on their big stickers. I know it sounds goofy, but ideally, they're really making the decisions. Because in a business, that's how it really works. And we're not creating some fake process of, like, oh, here's some utopia. Um, we want to be s fairly reflective of how they d do business, because, um, or else you know, the products don't ship that we make. And we you know, don't judge this experience based on, like, hey, did we everybody feel good at the end of the week? Um, it's more, like, we re really are measuring, did we launch the product, and did the product like, actually succeed at the things we hoped it did, you know, like three months later, when they actually develop it? Um, and so it's that kind of, you know, Semi-democratic but realistic um, kind of group decision making is, is very, very effective. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Hey, what's up? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there are a couple of things. One is that we the one of the first exercises we do is drawing out a fairly sophisticated storyboard of kind of who are all the actors, who are you know, all the users, whatever you want to call them, customers, who are involved in the process, and kind of all their steps towards getting towards what we consider to be a success point, right? And so you know, the onboarding flow for Slack, for instance, is like, oh, I heard about it in the news, or a friend told me from another company, or I was Googling it, or whatever. You know, it's a starting point, and then maybe I come to the home page, and then maybe I do some things, and then I try to sign up, but you know, Slack's not a one-player game, so you know, there's this really tricky part where one person signs up, but we need to get a second person in the room with them, either a second person or a robot that can talk to them. You know, is something we're trying. Um, so it's a combination. You know, you figure out these things, and then based on the data that they had, like we know what a healthy user looks like. So how do we get somebody basically from just barely have heard of Slack to being a healthy user? We'll sketch that all out. That's probably a little bit too much scope for the whole prototype. And so what we're doing from then is like kind of listing, well, what are the biggest disagreements on the team? So all those stupid hot, you know, the heated meetings that people had had, what are the biggest unknowns? And so we think of these things as risks, you know, risk management, and uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, where can we find the biggest opportunities? So it's not just about not making mistakes. You know, we do want to avoid making mistakes when we make these products. But also, we want to make big enough leaps that we're potentially setting up for like, you know, uh, exponential success, right? And this is a great environment. You know, if you're doing normal development mode, you know, the ship early, ship often thing, it's really hard to take massive leaps because you can easily fall on your face. You know, everybody might think an idea is really, really dumb, but like, oh, but if it was good, you know, if if our assumptions are wrong and it's actually a good idea, it would, it would mean great success for us, right? Like, what if we priced our product twice as much? 
Like, I think that's a bad idea, but like, I don't know how our customers are going to react to that. You can test those types of big ass assumptions in a, in a sprint and only, you know, you're only talking to five customers, it's not a big deal. Um, so we set out those big questions. You know, what are the things, you know, either risks or, or benefits that we could potentially tackle? And then look at the, the storyboard and find kind of where the opportunities are within that and then scope usually a chunk of it, a chunk of that storyboard and we'll sketch across that, that piece of the storyboard. Um, I can see this all in my head. I hope this makes generally makes sense to people. And the other thing, sorry, I'll get to you in one sec. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is when we're prototyping, we're prototyping in very high fidelity. So I, I think of this as, as medium fidelity. So the Goldilocks level of fidelity is, is how I described it in the book. Um, teams are often prototype as paper prototyping. Um, you know, I know a lot of design schools like paper prototyping because it, it looks cool and like um, it seems like a good idea. The problem is you put a paper prototype in front of a customer and the customer will um, respond to it. They'll be like, oh, I like your prototype. And then they'll talk about like, oh, if that was a real product, you know, I'd like this part and that part. And that sounds like good feedback, but it's actually really colored by their biases of like seeing it half finished. Um, and if you think of fidelity as a, as a graph, right? I'm just going to run off camera for a second. Um, you know, there's you know, fidelity, so kind of how detailed something looks, and time. Hold on, did I do this? Oh, I did it in the wrong order. Time, fidelity. Fidelity looks something like this, right? Is it paper prototyping is like here? Like, hey, we did some sketches and I can get really quickly to, paper pro to get a paper prototype in front of customers. But designers, once you learn some design tools, like if you're pretty good in Sketch or you know, Photoshop, whatever fucking tool you use, you can get this, like basically, you know, this is InVision or Marvel or, or something, or you know, whatever prototyping tool you use. You can make some, I can make something look incredibly realistic as a mobile app or as a, as a desktop app in a day. Like multiple screens, like just last Friday we did, a, we're building a prototype with a, a startup here called Managed by Q, uh, one of the startups we invest in. We built a maybe 20 step prototype in a single day and like granted, like we're all pretty good designers. You know, we've been around for a while. But I think teams should aspire to be able to, to do that. And you put that in front of customers, they just think it's software. And so instead of re, um, responding to your prototype, they actually just react to it. You know, it may not all work. You know, like I just created a, a dashboard for them where there's like, a, you know, like 25 links on the screen and three of them work. But you can like kind of create this sleight of hand while you're doing research if you kind of push you know, the users kind of in the right direction where they just feel like this is software. You might be like, oh, we haven't finished making that piece of the software yet. But like as far as they think, software. And that way they're reacting to it like it's, like it's real. And that's much, much more valuable. And it hardly takes more time than doing paper prototyping. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, um, I'm curious about what kinds of stakeholders from the portfolio companies in the room with you when you run a design sprint like that. Is it just yeah. purely designers or you run design sprints for like different functions? Oh, it's definitely not just designers. I, I would never do a design sprint with just designers. I mean, designers in, in dysfunctional companies, and I've, I've worked with a bunch of dysfunctional companies, um, and, and some, some big ones. You know, I've, I've even seen teams at Google that work this way. Like, uh, and they, they think that designers can just like learn about the problem and then ret retreat into their design den with their Eames furniture and, uh, <laughs> and solve the problem. It's such bullshit. Like, designers have this ego problem where they think that like, you know, we have some, you know, we're the only people with like the knowledge to solve your problems and we'll go off and solve them and then we'll come back and you'll build them. Like, fuck off. Like, designers are not that, you know, no smarter than anyone else. We just have some, some tools available to us that are they're very effective. Um, sorry, I got off on a rant. Um, <laughs> so we're pulling together a very diverse team in, in the, the sprint. It's always, uh, we need someone who actually has clout. So if, if, you know, my team's in this advantageous position where, like, Basically, if you, don't, if you don't put the time in with us, you know, we don't charge the money, but we charge the companies with their time. Um, if the CEO or the head of product 
isn't going to make the time to spend a week with us, it's fine. I've got 319 other companies to work with. Um, we'll just go work with another company. Um, so you need a serious decision maker in the room or else you're going to make a prototype and if the decision maker has a different idea, like, well, fuck it. He's, he or she's going to go do that idea anyway, um, with or without you. Um, so having the decision maker in the room, having uh, you know, engineers in the room is almost always the case, and having um, uh, so these other people who bring unique knowledge. So you know, when we were doing with we worked with Blue Bottle Coffee on their subscription program, um, having the customer service person in the room with us the whole week is immensely valuable. They know where all the holes are in their current e-commerce platform. Um, working with uh, I was working with a company that, that makes a wearable defibrillator, and uh, uh, you know, you we had somebody who uh, knows everything about um, medical device sales. Like, I don't know anything about medical device sales. It's a really, really hard problem. And if we're designing, you know, the system for, for selling this thing, like, yeah, we need them in the room with us. So this kind of diverse group of experts. So it sounds like there's some kind of prep work that happens before you go into the, the sprint where you, like, identify the right people to be there. And sure, sure. I mean, we, we schedule it uh, somewhat ahead of time, make sure we've got the right people in the room. And then if you really want to kick ass at this, you know, kind of the ad advanced class is to do pre-research. So usually there's a, these big open questions about what our customers are doing. And um, our researcher, Michael, will oftentimes pre-sprint, go and talk to a bunch of existing customers. And then on the Monday of the sprint, he'll give us like a 30-minute report on, hey, all right, you know, here's where everyone's blind spot is on this product. Here's, you know, all the other you know, ways that your customers, you know, all these other tools that your customers are using in conjunction with your tool. Like you don't exist in a silo to them. You know, these types of things that are, are the types of insights that very few companies are, are getting, doing effectively. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I don't know how much research you guys do as part of the interaction design program, but like research is our secret weapon for everything. Like ha almost every time I'm talking to a company, I'm like, hey, so it turns out you just don't know a lot of things. And that's fine, but like, let's go and find that out, and then you can make better decisions and work with Michael on kind of what type of research to do and, and go and, and uh, create those insights for them. And doing a design sprint without research, so Michael, you know, we have a researcher or somebody on the, the team who, who can do research in every sprint. And this is one of the most common problems I see with sprints is teams that they feel like they're in a, these teams with their foot on the gas, right? Um, and they think that they can't invest an entire week into planning a project. And so they're like, oh, where can we cut this? Oh, we just we won't do the research. We'll create this prototype and like, we'll just know if it's good or not. And you're like, yeah, you know, I've been designing for 20 years. And like, all, I, all I've learned in 20 years is how to be wrong faster. You know, I'm still not very good at anticipating user needs. You know, you certainly learn some patterns and see some things that work and don't work. But a lot of the time, what you're doing is, is trying to make these big guesses and try to test them really fast. And user research is like fundamental to that. And at its basic, you know, Michael's an excellent researcher. I'm not suggesting you can learn research super quickly, but you can learn the fundamentals of doing a user study and go and try it. I mean, he's, there's a video online that he's, he, he published called uh, Quick and Dirty User Research with Michael Margolis. Um, it's on YouTube for free. Um, and in an hour, he'll at least teach you the fundamentals of how to do a study. And like everything else in design, the best way to get good at it is to do it a lot. So, you know, read some books, watch that video, run some studies. Uh, I, I, it's, a gr I, it's a very, very powerful and very valuable skill for designers to have. What's up? It's an excellent question. Um, so it's interesting. So there are obviously some things are harder to prototype than other things, right? And so uh, hardware is one of those things that you have to really have a prototyping mindset if you're going to be able to do prototyping like that. Um, the, there's a few tricks. So one is that go back to thinking about what it was like in industrial design school. A lot of the time you are taping together like, you know, um, toilet paper tubes and stuff, you know, kind of finding ways to hack your way into industrial design. And so if you stop thinking about a prototype as, if you start thinking about a prototype as something that's disposable, 
which is very much how I think of prototypes, whether it's software or hardware, um, you start getting more scrappy about how you make something. So if, you use, if you're prototyping hardware, for instance, you, you think about like what are the questions we're trying to answer. And it's like some of it's like how do consu consumers perceive this piece of hardware? You know, with this, this medical device company, like can someone put this on or not? Right? Like put it on themselves, you know, so it's a set of instructions, but also like the device. Um, but you can hack that pretty quickly. Um, we worked with, we were talking to a company uh, like a year ago that uh, uh, came up after a talk at a conference. This guy came up and he's like, yeah, we started using uh, sprints at our industrial pump manufacturer. And we're like, what? Like, that's cool. Or somebody at Boeing was talking to us about doing sprints. And we're like, what are you talking about? Like, you're building, like, at Boeing it was a turbine you know, group. So they're building, like, massive turbines, right? And this other company was building pumps for uh, industrial facilities. Like, you're talking, like, an eight-foot-tall pump. Like, the output is eight-foot-tall. Like, these are, like, serious pumps, right? And we're like, I don't know how you prototype that, man. And, uh, but he's like, no, no, the, the question was, we're going to build this new pump with all this new functionality, Right, like it had a you know better system for I don't know airflow within the pump or you know something like that, and uh, or better maintainability. And what they did is they they were wondering if customers were basically willing to pay more for these features. And the investment they would have had to put into this pump was massive, right? Like you're basically setting like retooling a a, um, a factory to make this stuff. And what they did is they 3D printed a pump that looked just like the one they were going to make. And you know, certainly spent more than a day on it, but probably spent about a week prototyping that pump. And then they created a, uh, a check, uh, sorry, a, like a spec sheet like you would use to market something. And they just printed it off, you know, on the Eden Apple Ivan sheet that just said these are the features of the pump. And then they went to five of their existing customers and said, hey, you know, you bought pumps from us in the past. You know, we made this new pump. Like, basically, do you want to buy one? And they're like, oh, well, let's see. And they read the spec sheet. And it helped a lot to have the actual pump there, because it seemed real to them, you know, even though it's a scaled down model of it. And they'd read through it, and they're like, well, I don't know. I just like, we couldn't invest in it because, like, you know, we've had maintainability problems with the gaskets and our old pump, and like, this sounds like the same thing. And they're like, taking notes, like, you know, that's important. And they, they learned all these things from their customers about what was important to them, about kind of the, the, the functionality of this pump before they invested any time in even looking at the, the viability of making the thing. It's an excellent use of their time. Um, so I wouldn't say that everything is prototypable in this way. But if you think of things as, you know, you think of prototyping as a potential solution to answering questions, then you can, you know, like in a sprint, we'll write down the, you know, all the questions we've got. And usually about two thirds of them are the kinds of things you can answer in a sprint. Some of them, like you really do have to launch a product and see it at scale and get quant, you know, quant, quant, uh, quantitative evidence of whether or not it's a, a good idea. Um, there's a bunch of things you could only learn by, you know, like, um, oh, I don't know, like uh, technical viability. Like it's hard to know like, if something's technically possible by doing a sprint, but we can go and run some technical experiments against it. You know, and you run to this in hardware a lot. Like can we build this thing at the price point that we need to prep to do it at? Right? Uh, like you know, you have to go and like kind of sketch that out and go talk to a bunch of factories in China and figure out if you can get the components at the right prices. It's not a sprint problem. That's just a technical problem. But sprints are a good way to answer a bunch of those questions. Yeah. Is that I danced around your question a little bit. Is that all right? Yo, what's up? Sure. Okay. So the the big ones for us, and these are things like I'm I'm probing for when we meet with companies the first, you know, when we're first meeting with them to discuss doing a sprint is um, one, it's not an urgent problem. You know, a lot of teams will come uh, to us with a user interface problem, for instance, and you're like, oh, you no, know, I, I can help you solve that and we can go and test it with customers, but like, that's not like an urgent big issue for you, right? And if teams don't feel committed to, to the problem, like, Great, you did a sprint and it sits on the, the shelf for the next eight months because it was never prioritized by the engineering team. Um, I don't want to work on those problems. It's not a good investment of my time at GV. Um, we won't work on it. But a good way to ask that is like, what are the OKRs or the KPIs for the next, sorry, we're full of acronyms in venture. Um, kind of what are the big objectives for the company for the next you know, three to six months, like a shortish time frame? Or um, if you ask a CEO, uh, what keeps you up at night? another great way to, to ask that question. Uh, we'll do that a lot. Um, so working on the wrong problem 
big problem, you know, big issue. Not gathering a diverse team, another problem. You know, designers often think of a sprint as something just designers do, and you know, it's, everything falls on the floor if you do that, and you also just don't end up with a great solution because all those other inputs are really valuable. Um, working at too low a fidelity in the prototypes uh, is a big one. Um, and, and some teams narrow in too quickly on just one idea. Uh, something we do commonly in sprints is compete ideas against each other. So like when we were working with Slack on the out-of-box flow, we actually had two competing concepts, uh, both seemingly good, but very, very different from each other. And we mocked them both up and put them both under different brands, like not, didn't call either one Slack. We just made up like fake brands for them. And then we had the customer shop, right? And we said, hey, you know, here's a New York Times article about two new messaging apps. Like, let's have a look at them. And they'd be like, oh, okay. And they'd click on the first one and they'd kind of, okay, you know, try to sign up for this. And they'd go through it and then they'd sign up for the second one. And then we could ask some questions at the end about like, well, how would you describe the first one? How would you describe the second one? Like, what is the first one, you know, kind of, could they understand the kind of where they were once they got to the end of the flow? Um, and one, in that case, with Slack, one was clearly the winner. Um, oftentimes we'll cherry pick good ideas from, from multiple ideas. Because um, that's, if you don't do multiple ideas when there are, you know, when there are good ideas on the table, um, oftentimes the decision maker will have this nagging feeling in the back of their head that like, like we didn't test that other idea and like I was my favorite and like shit, you know, like maybe that's the way to go. And then they'll sometimes leave the research to the side and just go off and do that other idea. Um, yeah, those are the big ones. So at the end of the five days, so at the end of the Friday, we've run five user studies uh, across the prototype. And what we do is we very, very quickly collate the data. So we're doing live note taking while the, the research is happening and we're all watching the research. This is another mistake that teams make is they like, oh, go do the research and give us a report. Um, this is the one time that companies really get to watch their customers use soft, you know, their software or their ideas. Um, we try to hold their feet to the fire to actually show up for the research. Um, build so much empathy in people in the team to be able to watch customers use their software. Um, so we are taking notes during the day and on the Friday evening, um, we're pulling down like, oh, these are the patterns we saw, right? And recording those. Um, so immediately taking those lessons, if we happen to nail it out of the park and like, wow, like all our ideas were great, which happens occasionally. We were working with a robotics company last year and like totally nailed what they wanted to do and the team the next week just started building. I mean they, they went back into their traditional development process. You know this is not a replacement for shipping early and shipping often. It's, it's a better way to start that process. Um, so they went into their, their development thing right away. A lot of the time the, some things worked and some things didn't work. And the ideal process here is to do a five day sprint and then take those learnings and immediately turn around and improve the prototype. So the next week you can spend about three days on, okay, here's the things that didn't work. We're gonna do more ideation on those things and then we'll prototype them the next day and then we'll do another user study the next, you know, the next day. Um, that's where we see real success is teams that like, okay, general direction, a little adjustment. Okay, now we're gonna do a healthy development process. Make sense? Um, brainstorming. Uh, <laughs> teams sit around a lot and, and brainstorm and they come up with like, you know, I know a team at Google came up with game storming. Um, makes me want to throw up my mouth a little bit. <laughs> well, this is getting recorded, isn't it? Don't tell them I said that. Um, the um, brainstorming is this thing that seems really creative, right? It's like, hey, we're all going to come up with ideas. But it's really oftentimes a form of group thing. Um, so what we try to do is get people to do individual work. You know, even if I was working with a team, I was working with a team on a branding exercise the other day. And it's like, if you normally did a branding exercise, like one of the steps is like, let's talk about the company values, right? And a normal, I've been, you know, seen lots of agencies, even like excellent agencies do this kind of thing. And they're like, oh, okay, everybody, let's talk about values. And people start shouting out things and someone's writing it down on the whiteboard. And immediately, 
you, know, you see people gravitating towards ideas that were either expressed really eloquently or really passionately or that came from somebody with a lot of power within the organization, right? And this happens in brainstorming all the time, right? As people will immediately gravitate towards things. So in that values exercise, what I do instead is get people to, everybody spend the next five minutes and write down all the values in the company that, you know, that they see in their own company. Now choose the five most important ones. And with them, we put them all up on a board. And we've got you know, 20 of them. And then I ask them, OK, everybody spend a couple minutes looking at those and choosing the five from there that you think are the best. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go up and put dots next to the ones that people got votes on. And now we've got like this combination of everybody collaborating together, but everybody using their own brains to make good decisions. And that's much, much better than this like kind of faux collaboration that we get from sitting around in a room like you know spitballing together. Um, yeah, I haven't done like a brainstorming session like four years now. It's really not that helpful. No. Um, other things that people waste time on. Like user. Oh. Well, user. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, user personas. Are, we don't do much of it. I think coming up with really detailed user personas is like pretty, uh, it's a pretty good waste of time. I think thinking about who your customers are, like especially you know, um, like understanding who the actors are who, um, who use your product and how they interact with each other is super important. But this whole thing like you know, Tracy and she's like works at a cafe <laughs> and she, um, you know, like people do these personas, we do very little of this. I don't think it's very valuable, and in fact, it, it causes you to kind of have this tunnel vision on you know Tracy specifically, rather than you know a broader group of people. Um, I'm trying to think what other things people, I wish designers spent less time on. Um, you know, working at the right level of fidelity in a mock-up. I think designers love making like perfect buttons and uh, uh, have lining things to grids perfectly. You know, these kinds of things, you know, the craft of design. Uh, I think when you're in a prototyping mindset, though, there's a good reason we prototype in a single day. It causes you to focus on the things that really matter. And it's where things are on the screen, well, what things are on the screen fundamentally, kind of the general positioning of things, and most of all, the text. Designers like underplay how important copywriting is. I think it's not something. You know, definitely having a copywriter on staff is wonderful, but I think designers should push themselves to do copywriting. I think anytime I see a designer putting lorem ipsum into something or just drawing lines on a mock-up, um, I think they're abdicating their responsibility as the designer. I think I think you should try harder to, to write copy because it's hard. Uh, it's really hard. And if you when we run these studies, it's it's totally hilarious. Like the more you do these things, the more you realize like you know we'll do three prototypes against each other and like I'm a better visual designer than the other guys on my team and like my mock-ups look better like my prototype if we're doing like we're kind of dividing and conquering and I'll just do one of the mock-ups mine look better it makes no difference in terms of winning um, it's almost always the, the what you wrote and what you put on the screen screen at all um, so yeah I would I would really focus on writing yeah um, so I'm interested in your time as an early employee and also founding um, a company. Um, and I was wondering, uh, what do you think about the design skill set? Does it translate to founding a company? What do you think about a designer, co-founder? What kinds of skill sets do you have to align with to, to, to make a good starting team? So it, you know, like, uh, I'm going to say it depends, but that's an annoying answer. Um, I think designers need to be careful of having the hubris of thinking that you know, just because you've got a designer on the founding team that somehow a company is going to magically be super successful. There are lots of businesses where fundamentally like your business model matters a lot more than whether or not you can design something well. Um, and you know, like, like Airbnb is an example, for instance. They have good design and that contributed to their success. They fundamentally unlocked massive untapped capital in people's kind of unused rooms and apartments, you know? Um, so you couldn't design, you can't design your way out of not having a good business. Um, so design's not this gloss. And there's also a lot of fucking hard parts of running a business that have nothing to do with design. 
And I think I've seen a bunch of designers who started companies, and they're really good at design, and so they use design a lot. Um, hiring great talent, you know, coming up with you know a good ter um, a good um, um, uh, coming up with term sheets, coming up with a good cap table. These things are really important to the success of your business. Great, great business relationships, um, you know, having great engineering. So things are also really, really important. And you know, designers have to learn a bunch of these things in order to be great at, at, at doing business stuff. Um, so I would be, I think designers can be excellent founders uh, of things. They bring great empathy towards customers, uh, you know, a great perspective, especially things that are, you know, obviously consumer-facing products. I think there's, or Know, where the user experience matters a great deal to the success of the business, I think those companies should bring on a design co-founder. I'm, I'm very bullish on that. Um, but the designers need to make sure they're working on the right things and that they care enough about um, the fundamentally the fundamental business, which is, I think, yeah. So this, if you don't mind me jumping into one of the questions you gave me. So one of the questions that, that was sent was like, how do I think about product design? Um, as a term. Um, and unfortunately, in design, as, as you guys have probably started noticing already, designers create all kinds of terms, um, you know, interaction. I had some guy argue with me online a few months ago about whether or not he was an information architect, an interaction designer, or an interaction architect. And I'm like, oh god, like, <laughs> you would not believe how little I give a shit. Um, but product design is this term that's in, in the digital world, so there's industrial design, product design means it's it's, it's, its own thing. I, I don't mean, I'm not talking about industrial design. Um, but in digital design, uh, product design has become this kind of term for somebody who thinks really holistically about design, right? So the way I think of it, and they have nicely let me um, define this in that InVision movie that, that they made, um, is that uh, there's visual design at the surface, there's interaction design below that, you know, like what does it look like? Are all the bits in the right place? There's user experience design, which is, you know, how does this fit into everybody's lives? You know, like it's not just about the interface that we're building, it's about like, kind of what my customers are doing generally. And then fundamentally, I think any great product designer is thinking fundamentally about the business as well. Like I know I can, if you give me the task, I can make the right thing, but are, is it even the right task? And, and that's the thing I think very few people are doing very well. Um, this is something I, I've, I've been getting more and more interested in after working with so many startups. Um, a few, a couple years ago, we started investing in Europe, and uh, one of my colleagues and I, Braden uh, Coetz, and I went over to London, and we met with uh, like 30 entrepreneurs in a week. And the conversation, Every time we intentionally structured it this way. The first two questions we'd ask. The first question was, when you think of design, what do you think of? And these are all very good entrepreneurs, right? And they get nervous and they'd sit up and they do that thing where they, you put your arms across your chest or you lean back a bit because you're you know, in a defensive posture. And we see this in user research a lot, so we're very cognizant of it. Um, so they look defensive, and then the things they talk about were we need to have a great brand. That's really common in London. There's a, a deep history of brand design in London. They talk about, um, we have to have great look and feel. So they talk about the surface. And then they might talk about, um, uh, it has to be easy to use. So we need good usability or intuitive interface is, is the phrase they use. And that's as deep as they got into design. And what you notice with a lot of entrepreneurs is they've heard that there's this pixie dust called design. And Apple obviously had it and were successful. Um, Airbnb talks about it and they were successful and they've heard these companies are building design teams and it's really important to be successful is to have designers. They don't really know what it is, right? And that's, that's it's just really common. And then <clears throat> the next question we'd ask them was what keeps you up at night? And you see them visibly relax and then they talk about like now we're in their wheelhouse, you know, there's business. And they talk about all these other things. They talk about recruiting and retaining engineering talent. They talk about moving into new markets, especially moving to the United States from, from Britain. Uh, they talk about raising capital. So going out to, to raise a B round or a C round, and like kind of what's the investing environment like? How do they pitch to, to VCs? Um, they talk about all these things that aren't designed, right? And Braden and I, 
you know, immediately afterwards were like, oh, really interesting. Okay, let's talk about how design solves those problems, right? I think, honestly, very, very few designers, even design leaders, even very senior design leaders, very few designers think this way, right? Designers go into the decision-making rooms in, in companies, they go into the C-suite, and they talk about fucking design all the time. They're like, yeah, you know, we really need to make sure we've got a more consistent, you know, design. We need to, you know, have a better, um, you know, a framework for, um, you know, our systems design. We need to, you know, improve our typography and our marketing. And they talk about all these things that are definitely in designers' wheelhouse. Don't get me wrong; like designers should be doing these things. But designers need to more frequently stop and listen to the concerns from everybody else, everybody else in their business, and figure out what things are stressing everyone out and then go and help them solve those problems. And it's usually around these areas of uncertainty, right? And so one of the ways I look at this is, is that there are ideas all over the company, right? They're coming from people in the leadership positions, they're coming from engineers, they're coming from a lot, a lot of times from PMs. And a lot of the friction within companies happens because when someone expresses an idea verbally, it's not even really an idea, it's kind of malformed, right? And so when they describe it to you, what you see listening to them and what the person next to you sees listening to them are actually fairly different from each other. And so we're arguing around each other because we don't kind of have a thing to talk about. One of the great powers of design is it can make something appear real, right? And so this is that kind of that um, prototyping framework is that you can take this idea that you just heard and go and mock it up and say, okay, now we're all talking about this thing. And not only can we talk about it, but we can go and test it, right? And so it's a very effective way for designers to be fundamentally important to a business. If you came to me as a CEO and said, my biggest concern right now is hiring and retaining engineering talent, my questions are gonna be, okay, do we understand what engineers perceive us as, right? An engineer, as we've grown our company, you know, now we're 80, 100 people, we're recruiting up against Google now, right? And all these other, you know, largest startups in our area, which means that we have a harder time competing on, hey, we're the scrappy startup, right? You go off and figure out, okay, when someone approaches us, how are they gauging us against kind of all the other, you know, companies in our in our marketplace? And then you can go out and say, you know, look at system design stuff, like how are we actually making the approach to, to engineers? You know, where, where are we finding engineers? How are we talking to them? How does our recruiter, you know, bring them in? What does the interview process look like? Is it efficient, right? Are we asking the right kinds of questions? Are we pissing people off because we're kind of asking questions that are irrelevant? Um, and then how are we closing compared to our competitors, right? These are all things that designers can work on. You know, it's systems design. And then we can look at stuff like our careers page and our marketing stuff and look at how engineers perceive us when they come to those screens, you know, do something like a design sprint against that, bring in five potential engineers that we would consider hiring and have them talk through kind of how they perceive us as a company. This is all design, but very few designers think that that's their, their challenge. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm partly ranting about this because I, I want to encourage you guys to think about this. If you, if you go into the type of design where this is applicable, you know, doing product design at, at at companies, I'd encourage you to start thinking in this mode. Um, yeah, what's up? Right, so it's, it's about increasing the levels of fidelity, right? So if somebody in a meeting comes up with an idea, right, say an engineer is like, hey, what if we did X with the product? Instead of keeping on talking about it, I will go back to my desk and either sketch it out on paper or I would jump in, if I could quickly do it, I would jump into Sketch or something and mock it up in fairly high fidelity. Then I go to that engineer's desk and say, hey, like that thing you were talking about, is this, is this what you're talking about? And now I may not have got it right. You know, that person, I probably misunderstood some of it. But now we've got a thing we can work on together. And so, you know, that engineer, she and I would work on it together and, and come up with, you know, kind of closer. And then we'd kind of talk to other people in, the, in, in our group about it, right? Especially the decision makers. And now, like, you know, maybe they're like, oh, I don't know, like, I've got too much uncertainty around something, but what about this other thing? Well, now I'm going to mock up both of them. And now I'm going to go and do user research against both of them so we can get out of our own heads. Instead of us evaluating it, go and actually get some data around it so we can make a decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Because I think a lot of the times designers can be, you know, the designers I know who have been really effective within organizations are kind of that, that person who helps bring everyone together. They're not necessarily the person who's making all the greatest ideas in the world, but they're helping other people foster their ideas within a group um, to make sure those you know, good ideas don't get left on the cutting room floor and making sure that you know, everybody feels involved in the process in a way that you know, uh, draws on everyone's strengths. So the first thing is designers should not be an independent group. Right? I mean, they, they, designers in an ideal situation, and I'm speaking very generally here, I think you know, it depends what type of thing you're working on. You know, like a flat iron is very different from like a social networking startup. You know, they, they might structure things differently. Um, but speaking in very broad terms, designers should do critique with each other, you know, get together as a group to make sure they're working cohesively. But day to day, they should be sitting with their product teams, right? And so designers, most frequently, what we like to see, you know, we commonly see in good startups, you know, really uh, functional startups, is that product engineering and design are a tripod of a product group, right? And they're all drawing from, um, you know, interacting with people like oncologists and researchers and, I mean, uh, like analysts. Uh, so like at, at uh, someone like Flatiron, these kind of hardcore math people. Um, so, but at the, if you're working on like the customer facing product, um, what you really want to be doing is sitting with the engineers who are going to make it, sitting with the PMs who are helping you decide and, and dis, um, measure kind of whether or not you're successful, and then the designers working hand in hand with those groups on, on the work. Um, and usually the best ones have user research built in as well, but user research is usually more of a cross functional uh, setup until you get really big and then usually you have researchers embedded in teams like designers are. Um, and copywriting is the same way. Copywriting is, you know, by the time you get a, a full-time copywriter, you know, usually they start as like an umbrella role and then later on become embedded in teams as, as you get really big. Um, it's really broad swaths, but the idea of, you know, you know, I, I was working with some designers when I was at Dig and they were complaining that engineers, because they were embedded in their teams, they're like, it's really annoying. The engineers keep looking over my shoulder and bugging me. And I'm like, shut up. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, this is like your real opportunity to make the to get the engineers feedback on what you're doing and also to make them feel really involved in the process. Like, take off your fucking headphones and have a conversation with them. You know, it's a really nice benefit of being a designer is like you've got this big screen usually and someone can look over your shoulder and like see what's going on. Um, I think great designers see that as an opportunity rather than as an annoyance. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think about this a lot. Because uh, I'm in this role where, like, I mean, to be, be kind of open about it, I'm in this role where, like, I can kind of shape this to be, to do what I want, you know, to what I think is most valuable. And if this wasn't, I wasn't getting enough out of this job, like, I can go work in a lot of places. I have a lot of opportunities. To, I don't mean that arrogantly. I just mean realistically. Um, and so, to me, the interesting things in my career have been learning new things. Like, I'm, it's not that much fun to kind of just do the same thing, keep repeating it. So, like, you know, I got to work on some much larger branding projects than I'd ever done while I was at GV. I've done some interior design. And I get to work on a whole bunch of weird challenges, like like oncology and stuff that I, I wasn't otherwise that familiar with. So that's really gratifying about my job. So I'd want to do that no matter what I was doing. You know, if GV closed up tomorrow, um, I'd go find something like that's outside my comfort zone that would make me feel uncomfortable. Um, I'm interested in things where uh, the dough isn't set yet. Right? We've got some flour, we've got some water, we might have some yeast, but we're like not quite sure what we're making yet. Um, that also I get a lot of in this job. You know, a lot of times companies aren't sure what they're doing and helping them shape that is, is really interesting, especially the early stage companies. That's you know, really, you can fundamentally alter their trajectory. I always found that really gratifying. Um, and then doing mission-driven work is the other big thing that, that motivates me. And so getting to work on cancer research, getting to work on um, some really ambitious shit. Um, I got to work with Calico a couple years ago, which is like 
Art Levinson, who's the chairman of Apple and used to run Genentech. Uh, Google invested a huge amount of money into him to start a company to pursue human longevity. Um, I got to work on that a bit. Some crazy shit. It's really epic. I mean, they're trying to fundamentally alter human genetics. Um, yeah, those are the kinds of things that, that motivate me if, if I was working on, on new stuff. Um, and there are some people, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, actually. There's, I, I have some friends who are really interested in design management, for instance. I'm much less interested in going to a company and running a 100-person you know, design team than I am in um, joining, like, you know, if, if GV shut down the shop tomorrow, I would be interested in going to, like, you know, Stanford's like biomedicine program and finding a couple people who are working something fucking epic and go and help them build it from the ground up. That's it's definitely, you know, that's very personal to me what I'm into. Yeah. One more question? Yeah. Definitely a generalist, a proud generalist. Um, it's really interesting. I've heard, sorry, do you have a follow up to that? I was just going to be like, what is your favorite subject of life? Oh, just fitting it all together. Um, but the, it's interesting, I talked to a lot of students, and I, I've heard a shocking number of students whose profs have told them like, oh, don't be a jack of all trades, you know, master of none kind of thing. Fuck that shit. <laughs> I mean, if, if what you want to do is focus on one type of design and go really deep on it, like, knock yourself out. Like, everybody should find their own path. You know, I'm speaking very specifically to me. But, you know, I do a bunch of product designs, mobile designs, visual design. You know, I can design icons and logos and like um, you know, a huge range of, of stuff. Um, it's, it's worked out okay. It's like satisfied my curiosity. Um, I think there is something, especially earlier in your career, to be kind of T-shaped. You know, to maybe go deep in one area but have a broad set of skills. Um, I think that's generally okay advice. There's nothing wrong with being a generalist either. You know, some of the designers I know who've been really successful, like uh, Supa, sorry, uh, Adam Michaela, or Wilson Miner, like great writing, great code, great visual design, strong product design, like knock yourself out. Um, yeah, I, I'm always shocked how many people talk down about generalists. I, I don't get it. Like even one of my colleagues, um, I was talking to him and. Uh, he was like, ah, oh, I don't know, I'm not a visual designer. Like, you should just do that thing. And I was like looking at him, and I, I literally said to him, I was like, dude, you'll never be a visual designer if you don't do visual design. Like, it just sucks to be able to look at something and be like, oh, that's not me, you know? And like, he's a, now quite a good visual designer. It's only two years later. Like, it's fucking great. You know, now he's like much more dangerous when he's doing, you know, working with an early stage company because he can do a broader spectrum of stuff. I see all these designers, they come to, a Google or a Facebook or something. And um, one of the risks of going to a big company early in your career, not that, you know, again, follow your own path, um, but one of the risks of going to a big company is that design is really balkanized at big companies. You've got, on every project, you've got a visual designer, an interaction designer, and in, you know, a front end developer, and then your real development team and a researcher. And you're really not going to learn to do research. You're not going to learn to make your own icons. You're not going to learn, you know, you'll, you'll never make a brand. You know, if you come work at Google, like, good luck ever making a brand. You know, unless you're really senior, like, that's punted over to a different team that does that kind of thing. Um, and one of the benefits of, of working at small companies and being scrappy is to work on a whole bunch of these things and learn how they work. And, you know, I, I know I've said this a few times tonight, but. You know, the best way to learn anything in design is by doing more of it. You know, the, one of my colleagues, his, his analogy is like design's like playing the piano. You can read the theory, you can talk to experts, you know, like great pianists. You can, you know, uh, take classes and go and listen to, to great pianists playing. The best way to become a great pianist is to play a lot. And ideally have someone around you who can tell you when you sound like shit. Um, Anyway, thanks so much for having me. Oh. Chapters, I, I'm about 12, uh, 11 years ago, I moved to the United States. I moved to San Francisco and um, was the lead designer and then creative director at this fairly big at the time startup. Um, 
And from there, you know, Kevin and I uh, started another company called Pounce that we sold to, to Six Apart. It was like a social network back in 2008. Um, and then I left Dig around the, the zenith of, of the site um, just before the dive. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of you remember that. And, um, and something I've always wanted to do in my career is, is keep pushing myself to learn new, new stuff. And I jumped into a gaming startup coming out of, of Dig and joined Stuart Butterfield and Cal Henderson, so the, the team from Flickr. So I don't know if you guys remember, Flickr was originally a game, and a failed game, and then it had a photos component. They made that into Flickr, and they decided to go make another game, and I thought that seemed interesting. I'm like, that was a failed game, and they turned into Slack, so Stuart's pretty good at this, uh, this pattern. I think everybody will invest in his next game not expecting it to be a game. <laughs> um, I worked there for, for a while, and that was really interesting because game design is, is much, much different than web application design. You're dealing with motion, you're dealing with um, delight in a way that you really, you know, we're just getting to now in, in application design. And, uh, and it was a really nice segue that the next thing I did is uh, Kevin, the guy from Dig, he and I started uh, a company called Milk that was a mobile app incubator company, kind of spinning up, the plan was to spin up a bunch of startups doing mobile work. But, the gaming world and the mobile world are actually more similar. There's, there's a lot more you can do in terms of interaction design uh, in that paradigm. Um, and that company was bought by Google, and um, shortly thereafter, I, I came over to GV. Um, so what, is, what does a design partner in venture capital do? Um, and what is GV? So I, in a lot of ways, in most ways, in fact, don't work at Google. Uh, Google is... Uh, our LP, so in, in investing, you have, uh, usually have limited partners, and so these are the people who put the cash into your fund. Um, Google is our only LP, um, and so they give us about $450 million a year. So every year we get $450 million, and we take that money and we invest it in startups. Um, so a lot of things you'd expect, you know, a lot of tech companies, uh, you know, a lot of big data kind of stuff, but we do about 40% of our investing right now in the life sciences area. Um, so we invest in Flatiron Health here in the city. We invest in Quartet, which is a, so Flatiron's a big data oncology company. Uh, Quartet's a company around in the mental health care space. Um, we invest in uh, Grail, which is, uh, they're making a blood diagnostic for cancer. It's a company in California. Um, so we invest in, in quite a few life sciences companies. Um, and we've built up a design practice within the venture firm. So this is still a really, really rare thing. So there are individual designers in venture. Um, there, there's a bunch of them now. Uh, but we're the only design team in, in venture capital. There are, there are five of us. And we spend most of our time working with portfolio companies. So I actually, if you ask me about things at Google, I have very little knowledge of what happens inside Google. I almost never go to the office here. And uh, they don't really tell me what they're working on. Um, I spend most of my time working with the companies that we've invested in. And the basic thesis is that um, the normal currency in venture capital, so if you think about, you know, in California, there's a, a road called Sand Hill Road that all the big, fancy venture capital firms are on. You know, Sequoia, Greylock, like, you know, Kleiner Perkins, all the, I don't know if you've heard of any venture funds, but if you've heard of any, they're, they're on that road. Um, and typically, if you go and, and shop your company around on Sand Hill Road and try to raise investment, there are some common things you get. You get cash. You get lots of money injecting your company in exchange for equity. You choose a partner to work with or a firm to work with that has good connections. So connections are this other thing, because when you're trying to create partnerships or um, looking for an acquisition or you know, all kinds of, you know, kind of benefits of having uh, connections, your VC is often a good way to, to get introductions. And then the other one's advice. Right? So generally, a lot of the, the venture partners in uh, the Bay Area used to, are operators, right? So they used to run big companies. You know, we have the co one of the founders of Excite.com. We have a bunch of people who've spent time at Google you know, on operational teams. Um, and this is common across venture. A lot of, a lot of people can give you advice. Um, but you've seen a trend in the last five or six years where venture firms have started uh, also offering services. So there's recruiting services, marketing, PR, those kinds of things. And teams have started investing in designers. Um, so adding that to the mix is a, another thing you can offer. And the, one of the interesting things to me about venture is it's very close to the gears of capitalism. So you know, when we invest in, in companies, the, 
the intention is to invest in them for profit, right? And so if we're designers and we're working with portfolio companies, the very explicit intent is that we are making those companies more valuable. Um, we will be judged in the end on whether or not we generated increased returns for the fund. Um, I think there are other reasons that you know, you know, we invest in, we don't just invest for profit, we also invest because we want certain things to exist in the world and you know, we're not just investing, you know, finding arbitrage opportunities, we're not a hedge fund. Um, so I shouldn't talk so, so <laughs> down about hedge funds in New York. My, my older brother works at, at Two Sigma, which is a big algorithmically traded hedge fund. And if he was here, I'd still say the same thing. Um, <laughs> but so the, the way we think about design often is as, as an added investment. So we've invested, say, $10 million into a company. But if we go and spend a week or two weeks doing design work with them with the whole team, you know, five senior designers for two weeks, like this is a significant investment. You know, this is probably, you know, I don't know if you can extrapolate, but like a $60,000 investment from our team. Um, that's real money. And we do this because we think we can create significantly more value in, in the companies that we invest in. Um, and the ways we do that are, there are kind of high leverage things we can do with the companies. A lot of it's around product work. So at a fund fundamental level, and I'll get into this in a bit, um, design and product management come very, that we go and talk to a local e-commerce company that was doing like a big catalog company that marketed all over Canada, a big gardening company, um, and go and offer to do a free website for them based on commission. And so no money up front, but we you know, make like a 6% commission on online sales. And their, their site at the time totally sucked. And so when they ran the numbers, they were like, oh, great. You know, we're going to get a new website for you know, X thousand dollars. Like, that doesn't seem like much money. And we, you know, something like 6X or 8X their sales in the first year, it worked out to be a, a really good business for us. And also let us kind of gave us the, the inroads to get to work on, on more projects like that. And then the second inflection point for the business was a similar thing, but very different, is uh, back when Firefox was uh, you know, the very nascent, so it just rolled out of, so I don't know if any of you guys remember the history of Firefox, but basically there was Netscape. Netscape got acquired by AOL. Some engineers inside of AOL were like, this is fucking dumb. This is like a big, heavy piece of software. And they decided to make this, you know, roll it out as Mozilla on its own and make a light piece of just, just browser software, which was revolutionary at the time. So it's Ben Goodger and the other guy. Um, and uh, they launched it, and one of our, our uh, designers uh, was using it, and he thought it was great. But the interface looked terrible. You know, it looked like am amateur hour. And he wrote an open letter on his blog, which people blogged back then, and, uh, and said, like, hey, guys, like, this is great software, but I think the visuals and the overall fit and finish are really letting the product down, and you won't succeed. And this guy from Mozilla wrote back, and this is like, to us at the time, like this is some guy from California wrote us back. Like it was crazy. I mean, we're you know kind of this small town mentality a little bit. It was still wild to hear from somebody in California. He goes, "I read your letter. We passed around the office. We all like agree with you. You guys should fix it." And we're like, "Fuck! It's an open source project. Like we could fix it." <laughs> And so we got permission to get put together this group called the Mozilla Visual Identity Team. It was uh, me and Steven and um, John Hicks, who's an illustrator in the UK, really, really talented guy, and a few other people. And uh, we ended up developing the Firefox brand at the time, which was fucking fun. You know, we did this thing. It was like the first like large scale community project I'd ever worked on. Um, you know, the, the brand went out, and then we we had uh, I was in charge of redesigning the website as well, and. Uh, it was kind of my first lesson in, in uh, people coming out with pitchforks in, in the community because we changed it a lot. It went from being like a really uh, kind of um, Russian constructivist kind of look to more friendly and consumery, and developers are very upset about this. Um, anyway, that's a whole other tangent. <laughs> but we found these kind of two hooks. There are two of these major hooks in our business to be able to work on bigger things. And doing the Mozilla work led to um, this guy named Kevin Rose contacted us, uh, and he made a website called dig.com. And uh, it was about two months in after he launched the site, he uh, contacted us and asked uh, if we'd help him redesign it. He'd seen the Mozilla work. And that was the first like big Bay Area startup that we had ever worked for. And a few months later, I decided to move down to California and be the, the head of design there. Um, so yeah, that's the next chapter.
Hello, everybody. Uh, I see a lot of new faces in the crowd tonight. Very excited. Uh, so this, welcome to SVIXD. This is a monthly guest lecture that we do kind of you know, on different topics around interaction design. And the goal is to kind of like expand the definition of interact interaction design and what it, what it could be. Uh, so I'm beyond excited to uh, have uh, Daniel Burka join us this, uh, this evening. Um, just to set the scene, um, we wanted to have a talk that's like kind of around the intersection of design and uh, VC, uh, VCs, venture capital uh, firms. VCs in recent times have been kind of like building up their design presence. Uh, some of you might have met Albert Lee at uh, NEA and uh, Kinda Perkins has been having a design fellowship for a few years now. Um, but GV was, Google Ventures was the first to do so with uh, Braden Kowitz joining as a design partner in 2010 and it is one of the most prominent design uh, partner teams uh, today. Um, and we have, uh, Daniel Burka is one of five partners at GV with a design background. And GV has been in the news a lot recently because of their launch of the Sprint, uh, Sprint book, which uh, details their design sprint methodology. Um, and anyone who's seen the uh, Envision movie will be pretty familiar with the, Daniel's face <laughs> by now. Um, just a little bit of introduction, although Daniel's going to go further into it. Uh, Daniel spent more than a decade helping startups with product design. Highlights include his work with Mozilla, where he helped design the F Firefox brand, five, five years with the social network Dig, and early involvement with uh, gaming startup that morphed into Slack. And he also co-founded a startup that was acquired by Google. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's welcome Daniel uh, to IXE. <laughs> So the way we're going to do it tonight is it's more like a free form Q&A. Um, I've submitted some questions to Daniel, but uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, definitely start thinking and um, pose it to Daniel anytime soon. All right. Thanks. All right. So I'm, I'm going to try to talk without a mic. I think I talk fairly loudly. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Back corner can hear. Um, so just tell me if I'm not talking loudly enough. Um, ideally, it needs to be more fun for me and probably for you guys if we do this more like seminar style. So if you have questions in the middle of while I'm talking or want me to clarify about something, um, I'm not too worried if we don't get through all the questions. Um, so I'd be happy to go down tangents or, or kind of get into details on some shit. Um, so just feel free to put up your hand or yell out at me if I'm not looking at you. Um, so Cozy sent me some questions and I thought the most interesting way to, to go about this would just be go through them in the order that he sent them to me. Um, so, um, I'm Daniel Burka. Um, the first question he had was, what, what was your path to here? So I've been designing probably longer than any of you. Um, I started a design agency when I was about uh, 16 with my twin brother and uh, some friends in eastern Canada. So I grew up in like pretty rural Canada in a place called Prince Edward Island. If you ever have blue mussels, might be from where I'm from. Um, but it's like not like a tech center, right? So like there were a bunch of us in high school and we were interested in nerd shit and we you know, kind of glommed together and decided to form, you know, we were young enough, stupid enough or arrogant enough, depending on which way you look at it, that we thought we could start a company together. Um, and we just started hacking on design. And at the, the time, um, I was like a, actually a copywriter for the company. Uh, so I was mostly doing writing. And uh, I was also going to school full time. So a few of us were, were going to university while we started the company. Um, so I did an eight year undergrad in history. Uh, <laughs> so eventually, you know, when I was in like third, you know, second and third year, we started getting like bigger contracts with companies. And I'd have to go to tell my professors, they'd be like, yeah, so it was really fun starting that class. I know we're a month in, but I'm going to drop out of all my classes and I'm going to go do like a two month contract in Maryland. And I'd fly down to the US and go work on a pro project. Um, and so I started as a, as a writer and then one day we were working on a project and, and my brother was designing it and I was like, you know, we didn't have enough resources and I was like, oh, you know, I'll take a stab at that and I was interested in graphic design and, you know, getting critique from my friends, I was really lucky to, to kind of learn a lot of design. Um, and so that was, you know, I, I'm partly saying this because I think it's really, it was really uh, beneficial for me. I think most younger designers benefit from having um, some people around them who are both passionate about the things that they're doing, you know, kind of that's one of the benefits of coming to a program like you guys are in is finding some like-minded people. Um, but the other thing is that the, my friends were the kind of people who would call me on my shit, you know, if things weren't aligned, if things weren't done right, if I wasn't taking the right strategy at something, they weren't too nice to me. They'd tell me what was wrong and how I could be doing better. And 
you know, we really, you know, being that far out and that early on the, the internet, you know, this is the, the uh, early 2000s, you know, formed the company in 99. It might be the oldest web design company in ca Canada. It's still in business. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way we really learned was both about reading stuff online, looking at people's source code, you know, being able to look at that, you know, how people like Jeffrey Zelbin and these people who are you know, in New York and now I get to hang out with, which is still crazy to me, um, you kind of how they were all doing things. And we just learned by hacking and trying and looking at what other people were doing and uh, critiquing each other a lot. And that, that was really uh, beneficial to my career. Um, and then we ended up kind of building up, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem when you're, you're starting off as a, doing a design agency, is that you know, nobody will hire you until you do you know, bigger projects. And we figured out um, some hacks of how to get kind of big, big projects. And the first one was that we really wanted to do e-commerce work. And this is like early in the days when people were still afraid to put their credit cards online. Um, uh, sorry, I was about to ask how old everybody is, but maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, does anybody even know what a block.gif is? No. All right, so none of you have been designing nearly as long as me. Um, so we wanted to work on uh, big e-commerce projects, but nobody would hire us to, to do it, right? And so we actually, and this was my mom's idea, we worked out of my mom's attic for a while. Um, my mom suggested 